Uh, hello everybody. I want to take you on a trip that we've just recently completed. Um, I'm a statistician and as such, you know, my time is usually spent in front of a computer. It's usually spent um, in an office. And so you might ask, what on earth am I doing with this picture of a Jaguar in front of me here? Well, this started off with a conversation and then came back to the university and um, I started talking about this with a group of people who became very excited about what we might be able to do. And let me tell you about this and take you on our journey. So this was a journey of discovery for me in very many ways and, uh, and enabled us to really bring together a group of people in maths, stats, machine learning, visualisation, new technology uh, and very consistent with the aims of our centre in ASIMS. So the question that we were asked was how can people, so, so there's a really big question of threatened species and conservation and the problem here is that there's not a lot of data usually because for threatened species they're threatened or rare and the problem is that they're rare so we don't see them very often, there's very little data but there's often a lot of expert opinion and so how can we use that expert opinion to help us learn about conservation? And the particular question here was some people at the Lupuna Luz Foundation in Peru were asking, we want to build a corridor, a safe corridor for jaguars across Peru. But our question is, what land should we buy in order to create that safe corridor? And so the real question became, what are the characteristics of the jungle that are required for us to articulate that that's good land and then, put, and then consider that for purchase? So that then brought us to the question of how do we get at those characteristics? So we brought together a team of people involved in media, maths, stats, machine learning, visualisation. Some of these people are in the room here. And we really collected around this question of how can we do this. So the problem really was about eyes, we call it eyes on the wild. So for Lupunalus, the foundation in Peru, the question was to develop a network of partners and an evidence base for linking the Peruvian Jaguar corridor that they wanted to create into an international Jaguar corridor. For QUT, for our group, it was, as I said, to bring together these different disciplines to be able to support this aim. So the evidence base here is about identifying prime jaguar habitat to be able to estimate jaguar populations, their spatial distributions and trends in jaguar numbers over time. So that kind of statement sings to a statistician. That's all the things that we can do, but the question is then how do we collate this information? How do we develop these models about key threats and impacts when we don't have very much data. So, the expert, so we decided then, if we're going to do this, then we should go where our data aren't. So we, uh, we took off to Peru, uh, to two locations, to Amiria and to Pacaya Samiria. And uh, this is uh, some examples of uh, Amiria in Peru. Uh, you can see it's around a very big lake, these villages, and the Shipibo people are the local people in that area. So we interacted a lot with the Shipibo people, asked them about the jungle, asked them about jaguars, and that's really where we tried to understand the features of the jungle that were important for jaguars and for them as custodians of the land. In Pacaya, Samaria, we went along a river way deep into the Amazon and, uh, and then again interacted with the guards along that river uh, through the reserve and the local people there to see what information we could learn about jaguars. So here we are, statisticians hunting jaguars in Peru, for goodness sake. So the thing was, when we looked for primary in information sources, when we started, there were none. So this was our set of data. We found out um, during our trip that there are actually some data, there are records collected by the Ministry of Environment, by the Reserve Guard, guards themselves and through long-term infrared cameras by other foundations that are there. And so this was really helpful to us and we're looking to use this information uh, when we collect it in our next trip. So we had a very strong information source though from our local people. So these are some of the guides who knew a lot about jaguars and a lot about the jungle and the way that they interacted with it. 
We also have experts, experts around the world who know about jaguars. So the question is, how do we get at that information? How do we combine this kind of information? So I do Bayesian stats, so I thought, well, we can use our current understanding about, um, about a problem, the unknown parameters of any of these kinds of models that we're building, and we can describe that through a prior. We can then add data, should we have it, through a likelihood, and we can update our understanding about that model or that, that um, question, the system. So this kind of Bayesian updating is great, and it's through this prior information that we thought we could actually represent the expert information here. So how do we do that? Well, we can create distributions for the prior information, so we can, if we can come up with some sort of point estimate and your best guess around that, um, uncertainty around that, and then combine that with the data and we come up with some posterior estimates for model parameters or the system under, um, under investigation. So the question is then, how do we elicit this information? So we can either ask in a regression context then, here's a logistic regression, we might be asking about the parameters of that regression, but if there's a lot of parameters in the model, or variables in the model, we have to ask, given the other variables in the model, what's the impact of this particular variable on the probability of presence, and how certain are you? So if you're trying to, imagine you're trying to ask this of an expert, is one thing if you have many variables in the model, but also of a local person. So instead we can ask about the priors on the responses themselves. So if, for example, we have enough sites over an area, and I ask you about what's the probability of presence of, say, a jaguar at these different sites, and you tell me for each of the sites that we select, then you tell me about the probability of presence plus and the plus or minus on that, and I know the characteristics of those sites, then I can build a statistical model based on your expert information. And then I can combine that with whatever data I have. So this is the idea of this. So how do we get that information about those sites? Well, the other question is, how do we combine information from different experts? Because everybody's going to tell us something slightly different. So there are different methods that we consider to do this, and um, uh, there's methods like just getting everybody to agree, which works well in some circumstances and not in others. We can average the results. We can actually pool them, um, uh, acknowledging that they're a distribution, and we can allow each expert to have their own distribution and then combine those. So we end up with different kinds of combinations of information or distributions to give us these prior distributions that we can use in our modelling. So you can see here, for example, contour plots of individual prior distributions that we might be able to represent. So how did that go when we went to the jungle? Well, we got there and we talked to our local people uh, there. There's a community meeting to, um, to hear out what we wanted to do and then to accept our project. And what we found out was all of this, this uh, good ideas that we had uh, really went out the window with the local people. That's great for experts, but for local people, they just wanted to tell us their stories. <laughs> tell us your stories. Tell us about jaguars. Tell us about the jaguar you saw um, fighting the ant the giant anteater. <laughs> the anteater's on the ground with its legs in the air and the jaguar's circling, circling it and so on. Okay, so there's all these kinds of stories. So what we did was we listened to the stories and we put stars on a map. So here we are putting a star on a map of where did they see it and what was the story associated with it. So with these stars on a map then we can start to get some idea of the spatial distribution of different kinds of encounters and use this in, as some of our modelling. Uh, we could map the encounters to Google Earth and then we can use this as I said for, um, for um, our models. The thing is then, we wanted to ask, well, where are these jaguars likely to live? And so we've got local information, but again, we're very aware that we have these experts around the world. So here's an example of somewhere where a jaguar might be. Um, it's, an, it's a um, small lake area. Um, it's nice and marshy. There's lots of animals that come down to the lake and therefore lots of jaguars. Um, and so the question is then, instead of bringing the experts to the Amazon, to places like this, um, complete with 
uh, you know, travel and um, getting in there and mosquitoes and crocodiles and piranhas and all sorts of things. How can we take the Amazon to the experts? So then we thought, well, maybe we can do this through all the new cool technology that, um, that we know about. So let's create virtual worlds and immersive environments of habitat and present that to the experts and be able to use that to develop our models. So what we're trying to do here is to capitalise on the OO-R of new technology and sort of translate it to the AHA of science. So that's our aim. So we had these um, to create virtual environments then. We practised on a local um, rare and threatened species here, the rock wallaby, uh, and we created uh, virtual environments of very inaccessible habitat that the, um, the rock wallabies live in just south of Brisbane here. And we then used um, Oculus Rift and, um, and uh, our immersive environments to put our experts into this and then assess how they actually told us about these probabilities at the different locations. So we could find then through this very small pilot study differences between what people, how people responded to a normal screen versus how they responded for an oculus and um, I'm happy to, to go through these results in more detail if you're interested. What we got back in terms of um, feedback was not just the differences in the estimates but also in their responses to the technology. So for the Oculus, for example, for comfort, orientation, view, field of view, there were challenges in moving around the landscape. And importantly, there was this problem in creating a realistic landscape. So the, the important variables for experts um, who really wanted to see what do the rocks really look like for rock wallabies, which is a fair enough question, <laughs> but it's really hard to create a virtual environment that shows them that. So we looked at some alternatives then. Could we use drones, UAVs, to create this? And we've been doing some work in tracking wildlife and, um, and had some success with this. But the other thing that we wanted to do was to use new reality. And so, um, so we have some examples. So I was introduced then as the, 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 the um, novice statistic, ignorant statistician to all sorts of things. So June and Thomas, who are here, Ross, who's here, um, came along and they said, right, we're going to use some of this stuff. So here they are. They loaded me up for the Amazon. And I'm looking like this. And I have my, um, my 360 GoPros in, um, my, uh, GoPros in here. I've got my Rico. I kept getting asked, can we buy more stuff? And I said, sure. Well, it looks pretty fancy. So we've got our cameras here. We've got our, um, our little cameras here. And we were off. So here we are, we've walked through the jungle with these things. And I'll show you some pictures of this. So here we go. Um, we're practicing here. This was us with all of our gear. Um, and then we set off. So here's June here, um, actually taking uh, film in the Amazon. And some of the local people as well who found it very interesting to be using these, this headgear and seeing inside their environments for the very first time. Many of these people had never seen maps, let alone photos or GoPros or um, virtual reality. So we, we took these, um, these great pictures and, uh, and then we also went to different kinds of landscapes as well. So as I said, different kinds of landscapes, places where jaguars might be and also places where jaguars may not be as likely to be. So this is an example of a, um, of a cocaine plantation we stumbled upon and, uh, and also uh, where we saw jaguar footprints, which was really cool. So the question is then, what about the maths and stats? What can we do with this information um, that we have from these, um, these photos and, um, and films? So we want to create different kinds of models, for example, spatial models of jaguar encounters, Markov models for jaguar movements, Bayesian networks for the key factors and the impacts and Bayesian models that actually then can use the data that we will be collecting. So the spatial models of encounters, for example, we can create derived surfaces using the elicited encounters and available data. So that might be through regression models or through tree models or uh, other kinds of spatial, spatially um, mapped uh, model outputs. We can also develop uh, Markov models for abundance using information about prey, birth, death, uh, territories, etc. And look at the impact of hunting and um, habitat loss 
on the probability of the crash of the, the jaguar, so crash in the population of the animals. We can develop the Bayesian network of key factors that involves even more complex uh, relationships, not just habitat loss and hunting, but now including things like government protection. Uh, we can look at um, uh, pe how people interact with the environment, uh, economic development, petroleum exploration, and so on. And then this brings us really to the crux of it, the three ways that we might see in this kind of application. We see the environment, we can see the expert's opinion, and we can see from the model outputs. So different ways of seeing that are all combined in this particular project. So we can use this approach then in other situations as well. And one of them that we're working on is with the Great Barrier Reef. At the, uh, at the end of this year, Australia has to report again to UNESCO on the monitoring of the reef. The reef is a huge area, uh, it's you know, the, the size of European countries, and there, although there's been a lot of physical monitoring that's gone on, it's still very difficult to get good coverage. But there are any number of divers out there with their GoPros, and soon with their 360s. And so the question is, can we use that information to help us in our modelling? Well, yes, we can take these films, we can geolocate them to a digital map of the reef, we can automatically extract information or put experts into those films, extract that information and then use that to update our models. And that's a project that we're working on at the moment. In terms of the Jaguar, did we see one? Well, no. We saw piranhas, we saw capybaras, we saw ancient fish, we saw all number of birds and we didn't see a jaguar. We saw a footprint and we also saw jaguar pictures on things like beer bottles. <laughs> but, uh, that's a, uh, and we also saw some at the zoo afterwards because we said we had to go and at least see one. But um, there's always next time. Thank you.